One of the benefits of a small layout is that you can actually spend the time to detail scenes more than you might be able to on a larger layout. These are shots of the right end of the grunge layout before and after taking the time to do some detailing. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of The Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the tools and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. In this video, we're going to talk about how I added figures, signs, curtains, window shades, and some other details like trash cans and a fire call box to liven things up on this area of the layout. Hopefully you can tell just from those before and after shots just how much extra life the details breathe into the scene. Now I have to admit, I'm not great about detailing, as you can probably tell from the scenes on my main layout, the Monument City Terminal Division. It's usually something I leave until the very end, and that means that things can be a little blah for a while before I actually get to that step. But I do really believe that details make a huge difference, especially in the realism of a scene. So I decided to bite the bullet and detail this section of the grunge before I got too far along into other projects. Now one thing that I did that I've never done before is I made a checklist of things that I thought would look cool and that I wanted to include as part of this detailing project. That way I could have those details ready when I decided to get started. Now I didn't end up adding everything that was on the list to the layout just yet, but it does give me some options for later. As part of this project, I bought some 3D printed pieces from Miniprints, including their lawn chair set, their big wheel, which I thought was really cool, and a figure called the Moderately Agitated Mailboy, which looked like it would be a perfect grumpy old man sitting outside on the sidewalk. So this is what the mini prints looked like before I painted them. I then gave them an initial coat of white primer just from a spray can. And this was just to provide a base for the later color. So let's start with the lawn chairs. My intent was to use pastel colored Sharpie markers to get an effect that looked like this. These chairs tend to come in very pastel shades, especially in the era that I'm modeling. The straps they use tended to be striped and have little threads of other colors running through them, and that gave the chairs a somewhat uneven look in color, and that's the effect I wanted to try and capture here. Now, Before I got started, I tried to remove all the flash left over from the 3D printing process. To do that, I used my sprue cutters from Micromark to remove most of it, now I love these sprue cutters and I will include a link to them in the description. Remember, you can get 10% off your entire Micromark order at any time by using the coupon code PIXELDEPOT at checkout. The mini prints are delicate because of the very small cross sections on these pieces. So the side to side motion that I used provided the least probability of breakage, but I still sanded them very, very carefully. Now I mentioned I used pastel colors for the chairs. For the first chair I used a light green color that actually ended up looking more teal than green. For the second one I'm going to use light blue. Now what I did was basically just run the tip of the marker across the surface slowly and carefully and you can see that the color gets applied pretty quickly and fairly even. Now I'll also go to the back which at this point is completely white and run that marker across just like this. Notice that I'm being careful that it doesn't go on too dark, and even with being careful, this might be just a little bit darker than I want. We'll see how it comes out. Now I worked to get the tip of the marker into the crevices without hitting the side armrests, but what I found, especially with the first chair, was that I had to go back afterwards and touch up the arms because it's hard to not get that tip all over them without making marks. I kept the arms white because I remember having one of these, and I know I'm dating myself a little bit and marking myself as a bit of a geek, not that you didn't know that anyway, but I remember having one that was blue and the arms were white plastic. But I also remember from my childhood that the chairs my parents had had wooden arms, so I might go back and do some of the chairs with wooden arms. Now I'm not sure you have to color the underside, but I'm going to anyway just because if the chair falls over, and in real life these fell over all the time because they were so light, then I'll be covered. After doing the surface of the chair, I went back with a gray marker and used that to color what would have been the metal parts of the chair. I thought using the marker was a better approach than, say, painting it with an aluminum or stainless steel paint. I think the paint would just be a little too shiny and a little too thick and a little too bright. I think the gray here represents the dull patina that these chairs gained over time, and I really like the effect. One thing I noticed about using the marker here, and I don't know if this is just the gray one because the color on the others seem to go on heavier, but this gray one doesn't really put too much ink on at any given time. So I felt like I had a little bit of extra control. Now I can't guarantee that if you did the same thing with a gray marker that it wouldn't go on heavier. You'll have to test that out. As I mentioned, I went back and used a white paint marker to touch up the arms after I was done with the color. 
Now, I remember as a kid, the joints on these chairs would rust like crazy, so I'm going to use a Copic sketch marker to give the illusion of some rust. So the chairs are taken care of. I decided to leave the last one white, so it didn't need much for color, although I did need to do some white touch-ups at the end. I took this picture and noticed from that picture that there was some color all over the place and it looked pretty bad in my eyes, so I went back and touched up the white. I was concerned when I started with the yellow chair that the color from the Sharpie was way too bright, almost highlighter bright, but it did tone down pretty well at the end, and I think the wooden arms that I painted on helped to offset that effect as well. The next project to work on is this gentleman. As I mentioned, he also came from mini prints and is sitting on some milk crates, and that's really what drew me to this particular figure. Long time ago, back in the dark ages of the late 80s, I worked in a grocery store in the dairy department, so I was working with these milk crates all the time. When I worked at the grocery store, I remember that the milk crates came in basically four colors, at least at our store. Most of the ones we saw were black or blue, but some dairies did have maroon or an off-red color, and some also used gray. Based on my memories, I'm going to go with the blue and black here. So for applying the color, I'm going to start with the crates and then go back and do the rest of this guy's body. For the crates, I'm going to do the blue first so that when I go back and do the black, anything that I messed up will be easier to cover. Like I said, the lattice of the milk crates is very fine on this particular piece, and one corner did give way a little bit, so I may have to go and do some surgery to get this to stand up properly on the layout. More on that later. So I followed the blue up with black. As I was working on this guy, I had some trouble getting the tip of the marker into some of the smaller crevices, so I decided to try something that I've never done before. I decided to get a fine micro brush and load the tip with ink from the marker and then use that to try and get into those tiny nooks. And I'll tell you what, it worked like a charm. The ink stayed wet on the tip long enough to cover the surface and the micro brushes were fine enough to get into those tight areas and not spread ink where I didn't want it. At about this time, my eyes were bugging out, so I put on my Optivisor to continue with his pants. My eyes are just not what they used to be. Now I purchased my Optivisor and micro brushes at Micromark as well, and I will put links into the description. The various color Sharpies came as part of the set and turned out to be really handy for this project. You can get the Sharpie sets as well as the Copic sketch markers from Blick Art Supplies. I will put an affiliate link in the description below. Using those links and the coupon codes really do help me out and I'm very appreciative of any purchases that you make. Pants are done. We're going to let that dry for a minute because there was a lot of ink on there and it was already coming off on my fingers. I had to handle it quite a bit, and maybe that was because I couldn't get him to stand up. Here I thought he was a stand-up guy. So let's move on to the big wheel. This is also a mini print, and I was really excited, like I said, to see it because it's just another great childhood memory. For this, I started by putting the yellow on, and that was on the handlebars and the front forks, if you can call them that, I guess. The pedals and the seat of the big wheel were blue, and the body itself was red, although it was actually more of an off-red. I did start with a red marker, then decided that orange was a better fit. I used the same method here, including the micro brush trick, to color the big wheel and to get into the tight areas. For the blue areas, I tried the lighter blue of the Sharpie marker first. Turned out it was too light, so I went with a darker blue from a set of Bic markers. So back to our grumpy old man. Using the Sharpie, I gave him some quick color on his face. I may need to go back and do a black ink wash after this, just so there's some shadows. We'll have to see. I'm going to give him a blue hat and also some gray hair, and I'll go with a light blue sweater to offset the hat just a little bit. Many markers later, and we're done. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join my Patreon community to get bonus videos, graphic files, and other goodies, click on the link in the description below. So let's move on to curtains. Now this is a technique I learned many years ago, and to be honest, I hadn't used it in quite a while. I actually made some mistakes trying to remember how to do it, which I will describe as I go along here. Now the idea is to take plain old facial tissue and flood it with craft paint, and then crinkle that tissue paper up as it dries so that it looks like a folded and bent curtain. I started by cutting standard facial tissue into strips, slightly longer than the windows that I have. But this may be where I made my first mistake. I'll talk more about that later. I then cut the strips into even smaller, square-ish pieces, and I think this was my second mistake. 
I then grabbed a bunch of different colors of craft paint, and honestly, these colors aren't critical, so just pick things that look like they could pass for a curtain color. I used my palette that I got from the dollar store, and if you're interested in seeing that video, there is a link to it up above. Squirted the paint into the palette and got ready to go. Now, the tissue is going to soak up the paint a lot quicker than you think it is, so don't be afraid to be a little bit liberal when you put it in the palette. Once you have your paint, get a wide brush, then just start to paint the tissue. I started with a smaller brush and it really wasn't wide enough, so you really want something that's going to cover the tissue pretty quickly and pretty broadly. As you paint, the tissue is going to bunch up and that's okay, that's actually the look that you want. My tissue started folding over on itself and that's because of the way I cut the tissue to begin with. If I were doing this over, I wouldn't cut the tissue lengthwise to start like I did. I would actually cut it the other way and into larger sections because you can always cut it down to size later. If the paint is too thick and isn't spreading on the tissue well, you can wet the brush with some water and that will help the color spread and coat faster. Now you're just gonna paint the heck out of these tissues, making sure there's no white showing when you're finished. Repeat for your other colors. The colors I chose came out pretty well with the possible exception of this green, which is, well, green. But you're not gonna see much of it in the window anyway, so it shouldn't matter. Once you have your tissue painted, you can use an X-Acto or two to kind of scrunch up the tissue on the surface and then set it aside to dry. I took mine off the bench and let them dry for a couple of days. Once I was ready again, I brought the glass back over to the bench and just used a chisel blade to scrape the curtains off. Now the great thing about this method is that the painted tissue stays pliable for a very long time, so scraping the tissue off shouldn't hurt the curtains, and as a bonus you can still shape them as you put them on the building. Now I first cut these to size, cutting them just longer than the window so that it looks like the curtains hang correctly. This is another instance where cutting the tissue differently to begin with probably would have been helpful since a couple of these squares that I did use, they were a little short. Once cut, you can just attach these to the inside of the building. I just used a little white glue and attached the curtain above the window material. I did find that applying the glue to the tissue itself instead of the plastic worked better and gave me more control. This is where squishing the tissue together is going to come in handy because it makes it look like curtain fabric. Now I try to vary the looks and lengths a little as I do this with some curtains open and some closed, and it may take a couple of tries and some experimentation to get them to look like you want and hang how you want, but that's okay. Now I know some people do that whole thing where the curtain is outside the window, but I'm really just not a huge fan of that. I think it falls outside the mantra of model the mundane that I generally subscribe to, and I've never actually seen that happen in real life. Your mileage may vary. I will say this method may not be for everyone. I think they look decent, but my wife was not really a fan of the look, and especially of the green. Back in the 70s and 80s, window shades were much more common than they are today, at least as far as I can tell and as far as I remember. So for some of these windows, especially those that I deemed to be the bathroom windows, I decided that the people who lived here would likely have window shades. To do this, I just cut some white and off-white cardstock into lengths. So the white paper represents newer shades, while the off-white represents older, discolored shades. And I'll just apply these to the windows randomly. Now, I happened to be having a discussion recently with someone who was also talking about window shades, and his method was to use masking tape for the window shades, which I thought was pretty clever because they were already the off-white color and the adhesive was already there and ready to go. To attach my window shades, I went with white glue again. Now these window shades were notoriously hard to get to the exact position you wanted them, so I made sure to put them at different heights as I applied them to the windows. There was even one single piece that would cover a double window that I kind of chopped up so that it would look like they were different heights. For the windows that I assumed were bathroom windows, I set them so that they were completely down. Now for bathrooms, another thing you often used to see was that the windows, especially in apartment buildings, were frosted so people couldn't see in. The way you can represent that is to frost the plastic material of the windows here. Using concentrated dull coat from the bottle, I used a micro brush to apply it to the window material. The dull coat will craze the plastic, giving it that frosted look once it dries. Now you could also do this with dull coat from a spray can, but I would suggest spraying the window material before you actually install it because I think once it's in the building it would get kind of messy and you have the potential of hitting other windows that you don't want to be frosted. I thought it would be cool to add a hopscotch 
court, I guess, board, I, I don't know, to the sidewalk. Now, when I was a kid, the girls would use chalk to draw the hopscotch court board, whatever you want to call it, on the ground and spend what seemed like hours jumping back and forth. Now, I don't ever recall seeing one of these on a layout before, but it seemed fitting for this tenement, so I decided to try it. Now, I'd already applied the hopscotch board on the sidewalk on the layout before I filmed all this, but I can show you how I did it here at the bench. All I did was take a white Prismacolor pencil, and again, I'll give you a link in the description, and I sharpened it to as fine a point as I could. I then just drew out 18 square inch squares and numbered them. Now here at the bench, I'm just eyeballing this and going pretty quickly. I was a little bit more careful on the layout version, but not that much. What it is is a quick and easy way to add an infrequently modeled detail to the layout. If this took two minutes to apply, I'd be shocked, and it adds a really nice flavor that people actually live here. The next thing I wanted was a fire call box on the corner. Back in the days before everyone had a telephone, and to be honest, even today you still see them around in some places, you'd see these fire call boxes on corners all over the place. They were tied directly into the fire department and you would pull the lever on the box to report a fire in that area. This one is a white metal casting and I honestly forget who makes it. So if someone could help me out and tell me who it is in the comments, if you recognize it, I would appreciate that. I decided to paint mine red with a grimy black post. I started with a coat of gray primer and once that was dry, I painted the top portion bright red in this case, polyscale Sioux line red, and then using a set of locking tweezers, set it aside to dry. Once dry to the touch, I painted the post portion with grimy black paint. The final step was to use a paint marker to add the white to the lever. I dabbed the paint on using almost a dry brushing technique to make sure it didn't go on too heavy. While all that was happening, I also had some figures and other details to add. These trash cans used to be on the diorama I had built to showcase the diner that is also now on the grunge. I like this one because it has a cat on top doing some uh, grooming, I guess. I also decided to use this dog and this kid on one of those hoppity hop toys as well as a fire hydrant. I used Woodland Scenics accent glue to apply these details in various locations. I started by putting it on a card and letting it dry just a little bit. All I'm going to do then is dip the figures and pieces into the glue on the card very carefully and then apply them in the locations that I want them. Now this lady I'm going to have sitting in this chair. I decided to put the dog on the stoop, so I used the tweezers to place him since getting my fingers in there was not going to be the easiest thing to do. Now the nice thing about the scenic accent glue is that it stays tacky so that you can move things around. But there are a couple of drawbacks, and one is that it does tend to leave some residue behind. And if you've applied weathering, especially using pan pastels, it can disrupt or smudge that weathering, leaving a spot there that's not such a great result. These other figures will get stuck on the sidewalk area around there as well so that they'll all stay put. I now put the building back in place. For now, I like the idea of the building staying free-floating, so I'm not going to tack that down just yet. You'll notice that you can see those curtains and shades here. I'll leave it up to you to decide if it's an effect that you like. Uh-oh, I knocked my lady out of her seat when I carried everything over in my hand. Eh, it's an easy fix. That's my fault. So we use the scenic glue to tack down the chair, followed by the fire hydrant, which actually took a few tries. The trash cans will go over by the edge of the building. The little kid with the bouncing ball will go near the hopscotch board, and this little girl I will place here so she's ready to hopscotch. I imagine that that big wheel belongs to her as well, so we'll put that over here. And then this old gentleman will glue on the bottom. He's over here kibitzing with that lady, watching the goings on. I'm gonna get my tweezers for that one get him to sit where I really wanted to sit. Again, if you'll recall from earlier when I was painting him, he tips a little bit. So, trying to get him to sit flush. Maybe a little more difficult than normal. So I've added some additional scenic glue to him. Let's see if we can't get him to sit where we want him to sit. Come on.
While we're at it, if you're enjoying this video, now is a great time to press that like button and an even better time to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to click the bell to get notified when new content is available. Of course, he sticks to the tweezers, but not to the sidewalk where you want them to stick. Okay, that is my look. Stick there, you old fart. After a few frustrating minutes trying to place the figure of my grumpy old man on the crates, I did finally get him to sit how I wanted to, and then I moved on to the next step. My little girl fell down. Well, almost. I decided to do some signs for the building as well as for the street. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I don't think modelers in general use enough signs on their layouts, so I wanted to take care of that. I put together a quick variety pack of signs, including the ones I'm going to use here, and those are available for download in HO, S, O, and N scales, so I hope you will check them out and join as a patron. I used adhesive sheet here for this. It's basically a normal 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, but it's got an adhesive backing like a sticker. And that adhesive backing is sometimes hard to separate. So what I have here is some 5 thousandths thick styrene, and what I'm going to do is apply the adhesive sheet to the styrene before cutting it out. I actually trim the signs down to almost their regular size and then apply the adhesive so that I'm not wasting a lot of styrene. And then I can cut them out to the fine lines that I want at the end. Now the reason I use such thin styrene is A, when I cut these out I'm going to use scissors to do that, and B, it gives me a nice, stiff, stable sign that I can color or paint the back of. It's easy to glue onto surfaces, and it's a reasonable thickness to represent sign material. When I cut, I just eyeballed the sign and trimmed down to the size that I need. I've got some for rent signs to apply to the building, as well as some street signs that I will also cut out. Here, I'm coloring the backs of the signs using a silver marker. You can also use a black marker to go around the edge. I didn't do that here, but I may go back and do that a little bit later because they look a little funny. I sized the sign to be the correct scale size, so when you download the sign pack, you should have no issues. Now this stop sign is 36 by 36 inches, and the no parking sign is 24 by 36 inches, which based on my research are realistic prototype sizes. I'm going to attach these to some 60 thousandths channel that I've painted gray to represent the signpost. I prefer the channel to styrene rod or styrene strip because I find it's a more realistic and prototypical looking shape as well as it giving more stiffness. I apply these using medium CA and part of the reason for that is that you want the signs to be centered on the post and the medium CA gives you some time to play around and get things positioned correctly. For my signpost here, I cut these down so that they're a scale 8 feet. I had to trim off some after since I always forget that first foot on the scale ruler. Now these signs are ready to get set into the sidewalk. I'm also going to add the for rent signs to the building. One of the for rent signs I cut down so that it would fit in between the window sills here. I used a dab of medium CA here to attach it to the building as well. I then repeated the process for the sign on the front of the building. To apply the street signs to the layout, I'm first going to remove the buildings temporarily so that I have access to the sidewalk and I don't do any damage. What I used here was a 1 16th inch drill bit in a pin vise, and I tested that out. It's very close to the same size as the 60,000 signpost, as well as the base for this fire call box. So the stop sign we're going to put right here. And I've just got this in a pin vise just to go through. That should be enough to get this sign in, I hope. Maybe not. I'll give it another quick clean out here. I did something similar for the no parking sign, making sure to go deep enough through the sidewalk for the sign to go into a scale depth. Pin vices are great for this type of work because you don't have any vibration damage like you might if you were using a drill. The last step was to put the fire call box on the corner near the tenement. The size of the drill bit was close enough to the posts of the signs and fire call box so that it was tight with only a press fit, so for now I didn't glue them in. The last thing I added was this potted plant to the second floor landing, and with that, I called it complete for now.
The result is a scene that is much more lifelike than the plain empty streets and sidewalk that I had before. It now actually looks like people live here and less like a neutron bomb went off. Now I may go back and add more detail later, but for now I think this is a good level. Let me know in the comments what you think and if you have any suggestions on how to improve the scene. As always, the comments are also the place for questions, random musings, and so on. If you want to see how I built this tenement, you can check that out up here. For another video on mini prints, this time shopping carts, you can click below that. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.